Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, next one. Does this work? So, sorry for this one. Next one. Ah, uh, the other one. Okay, perfect. Okay. Thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure to see so many family friends. So, let's picture our friendly solo staker. She's happily validating Ethereum, and then Sally, oh no, what's going on? Everything is on fire, we're getting attacked. Our computer cannot validate, what's going on? Okay, Ethereum just suffered one of its greatest liveness attacks since 2016. Really dangerous stuff, so what is going on? Well, that's what I'm gonna talk today. How can this happen, and what are we gonna do to prevent it? So, very quick interaction. I'm Dab Lion, your friendly Lion Cordep. I'm the team lead at Lodestar, and I'm also contributing to research these days. So, let's explain first what is the problem. So, the merge was great, we don't deny that, but it introduced a very specific quirk that allows very damaging attacks to Ethereum liveness. So, before the merge, in proof of work, whenever you publish the block, you would attach the proof of work with it. This seems very innocuous, but what it means is that the moment that you publish the block, you include this proof that irrefutably assigns you the role to publish this block. Now, with proof of stake, you are elected in advance. What this causes is to create a gap between election and proposal. And this is exactly what an attacker can use to exploit this gap and launch those attacks. It can figure out who you are, this is not that difficult to do, there has been the anonymization attacks in the network before, but you can do this once and twice and thrice and basically compromise Ethereum liveness as long as you can dodge these individual machines. It will be basically before proof of work, you have to take down the entire network, now you know who you have to take down forever. So how can we solve this? Well, we have to somehow introduce secrecy to the election. And there are two main techniques. First one is probabilistic, so we would have some strategy to elect between zero and n proposers. And the one we're going to talk today, which is single secret leader election. The fact that you can secretly elect exactly one entity per slot is really complicated, and this is why we need all this crazy cryptography. The first one would be much easier, and we could do it already. However, due to the fact that we could have multiple people or no people, it has really undesirable properties at the fortress level. So, a good single secret leader election protocol has to have these three properties. It has to be fair, so everyone has the same chance to participate. Unpredictable, the leader only reveals themselves at block production time. And unique, where only one party is selected. So WISC is the specific implementation that we are considering for Ethereum. And how it works, I'm going to explain very simple here. Don't worry, it's not that complicated. So let's assume that every participant commits to a specific secret that we will call K. What this person publishes on chain is this C of K, which un like uniquely points to this commitment. Once we have all of these commitments, we will shuffle them in stages. So this person, the yellow one, would choose the first two and do a secret swap, maybe swap or not. Then the next person does the same. As long as shuffling, it will also re-randomize them. So it will multiply them by a constant, and in the curves that we are dealing with, when you multiply by constants, you completely lose any way to trace the commitments from one to the other. So for an observer, the first row commitments look like gibberish compared to the, to the next ones. And that's how can we have a secret shuffle. At the end state, there would use some randomness like Randall to select the final ordering, and that would dictate who has to propose at the first slot, second slot, third slot. So just to have a bit more of a specifics, the commit function is taking this secret k, which is a scalar, and multiplying by the generator. And we have this pair of g, k, g. When you randomize, you multiply the tuple for the same, um, for the same scalar. And the way to verify that you are the proposer is just you multiply the first thing. So k times <coughs> rg equals rk g. If this holds, then you are the proposer. And when you have to propose, you would prove this equality in zero-knowledge fashion with some blinders. So you don't actually have to reveal K, and you can continue this, doing this for all of your proposals. So that's the, that's the protocol. And when we start to get into practicalities, the first question is, 
cool, how do we put all these commitments on chain? This is what is called the bootstrapping problem for Visc, and it's quite annoying, because this is a lot of data, and we have a live system. So what we have to do, no matter what, is if commitments are not deriverable for on-chain data, we have to submit them. So there has to be some sort of bootstrapping phase where we start from having no commitments at all to some commitments. How this looks in practice is that we have an unsafe phase where we have to initialize everyone to some sort of deterministic unsafe commitment and perform the, pro the, the protocol partially. So the different strategies that we're considering, the first one is the current spec is the most simplest, very low complexity. But what happens is, if you expect everyone to submit the commitment as their own proposal, what you can do is you can toss this person and prevent it from ever submitting the commitment, so preventing them to have access to the secrecy of WISC. And you can do this basically forever, keeping a subset of validators outside of the shuffle in perpetuity. This is also a bad protocol because due to how you have to select these initial and safe values, it makes discovering them very expensive for any validator that doesn't have access to archive data, which is undesirable. What we could do instead, if we want to have a bit more complexity, is submit these commitments through gossip. Sort of like we did today with the BLS to execution changes. This adds more complexity, but we don't have the first problem, but we still have the expensive duty discovery. What we could do instead is say, we have sort of a double fork, so we have the WISC fork, everyone starts submitting commitments through gossip, but we don't run shufflings. After some time where we have enough shufflings, then we activate the protocol. So if someone doesn't submit the, its commitment yet, it will not participate in the shuffle. And this removes the, 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 third, the second problem. But this sort of double fork mechanism is complex. We have done it in the past for the merge. But if we can avoid it, then great. And I'm going to talk about some optimizations that, that are done at the cryptography level to get around all these problems. So here we are talking so far in terms of these uh, little mens that represent a validator. But today architecture is very complex. A validator is actually all of these components. And the whole point of this protocol is to remain private. So how far should you leak knowledge of K into this chain. It's obvious that if it goes up until the builder, builders are untrusted, so that's not good. We don't want to do that. Relayers are trusted, but they may not be in the future, so we should not leak the K to them. Even the beacon node is a sort of middle trusted participant. Some people have fallbacks into other beacon nodes that they don't trust, so we should not leak K either to that level. So what we really want is to keep K into the yellow box strictly limited to the web designer and the beacon client. We can do that. And this is the interaction that I propose to do so. So when you start as a validator, you pick this random key, and you ask the beacon node, hey, what is the tracker? Uh, I think I'm going back to this, to this one. Remember, you have the selection step. So you have this rkc1. If you know what this tracker is, then you can do this quick verify operation and know if you are the proposer. Then, if you are, you would notify the beacon node, hey, I'm going to propose. So here there is an information leak, yes, but it's only one slot ahead and it's not permanent. The problem is that for block production, you need to set the field recipient to something, at least with the current architecture, so that you can basically give the fees to the person and also do MEV. But we're, talk we're going to talk that in a second. After notifying the block proposer, you can compute the proofs inside the validator client. That acts at some complexity to the VC, but I think it's fine with the current spec. It's just regular BLS cryptography. And then when you're done, you just submit the proofs and the beacon node can create the block on its own. So just for completeness, how it's going to look, it's these routes. And let's talk now about EPBS. So with that, we solve the BNBC, where we keep K as tight as possible. But the big problem is how the hell do we merge that with EPBS? So today, the next proposer is known. So the builder can just query its own beacon node and ask, hey, who is going to propose? And then it uses this registry that everyone participates as part of MEV Boost that it declares, I'm proposer index 1 million, and this is my fee recipient. 
So the builder will query this database and through the use blocks for this specific field recipient. Now with WISC, the builder should not have access to this information because otherwise it would completely defeat the purpose of the feature. So the way I propose to fix that, well, just to clear, clear here, you have to leak K because the proposer needs, needs to tell who is the field recipient for the builder to make profitable blocks. So we, just, we don't have to do that. We should keep the proposer secret until the block is proposed. The way to do that would be for the builder to set the field recipient into something else, some neutral entity. That, for example, a rewards collector address. So this could be handled at the protocol level. And then all the fees are sent here. Then in the next block, the actual proposer can claim the rewards because it's set in the beacon header who is the intended uh, fee recipient address. This could also be done, I think, at the relayer level before we have enshrined PBS with maybe some sort of relayer collector address. And the relayer would just tell the builder, hey, this is the address, please send it here. I'm not going to tell you who the proposer is, but I know. Then collect the fees and then distribute in the next block. But it sounds very custodial, so it's not good. And I'm hopeful that we will ship PBS by the time that we do this. So I think this solution makes more sense. Cool. So I think we have covered now more of the, the theoretical parts of PBS. But um, yeah, WISC is expensive. WISC takes um, quite a bit of complexity into the protocol. It will be the first time that we have to introduce CK into the beacon chain. It will double state size and it will add about like 17k bytes into the block size. So this is a non-trivial complexity and why this feature has not been prioritized yet. Um, however, we can optimize it that way. So the shuffling protocol is a brilliant construction done by the EF cryptography team and I think it cannot be optimized that way. But for both the data and the bootstrapping, they are looking into eliminating the randomized based. So if we can do that, then we will decrease state size from maybe 2x to like 0, like 1.3x, which is still much better. And then the key optimization is if we can actually derive commitments, that would be amazing. Because let's going back to the, to the here, like how the hell do we introduce all these trackers? Well, we could derive all of them from the public key. And then we don't have to keep anything on the state. We don't have to have like this weird bootstrapping phase. So we'll be in business. Why we haven't done that yet? Well, it's very complex. Um, all of these like math would happen on the GT group. And that is both very expensive and not yet developed. Um, but we're looking into it. We'll see. So. Yeah, WISC works, it's very expensive, but we have optimizations. And just to compare it with some other solutions, as I, as I was mentioning before, the election doesn't strictly need to be single. It's better because then we have only one block per slot and the four choice reasoning is much simpler. But we could just have this probabilistic where we could have zero or N. In that case, there are some implications at the MEB level because if you have competing blocks, um, I think there are some timing games and different attacks that can be done which are quite nasty, uh, but we're looking into it. And then the other one is just do not mess with the protocol and just put some anonymity on the network. Um, we are exploring that. Um, we participated in this project called Dandelion++ and Polkadot has something called SASFRAS. Uh, the thing is, at the network level, anonymity is really hard to have it persistent. And basically, on-chain identities last potentially for years. So if you can break the link, the anonymity, through months, it can, you can still launch the denomination attack. So I don't have faith that we will find a network anonymity solution that is sufficiently strong for Ethereum mainnet. So, all of this is the theory, but there is a proof of concept. Uh, I implemented the whole protocol in Lighthouse, and this is running today in a DevNet. Uh, we have an explorer, and the whole thing 
deployed by Paritosh and the Hispanda teams, huge shout out to them. Also uh, modified Explorer by a new guy called PK. Um, as you can see here, whenever the block is missed, we have no idea who proposed it. That's, that's the interesting thing about this protocol. Um, if no one, sub no, no one shows up and submits the proof of who had to propose the block, never, never the network would know um, who, who missed that. Uh, that's also a very important caveat that protocols like liquid staking protocols, I think Diva, this could break a little bit how, how their model would do. Um, so it's important that they take into account if we ever ship this feature. So from here, we are working really hard on these optimizations that could dramatically make the protocol much simpler, much cheaper, and hopefully the core devs would not cry about it like they have done <laughs> until now. Um, the other thing we could do is just do nothing and wait for an attack to happen, and then we'll have to all rush and do this feature, uh, which is not ideal either. So I think the most reasonable path forward is to have these cards ready. We have this feature, study it well, research. We could do an implementation rather quickly. So if ever Ethereum goes under attack, we have this card that we, that we, that we can use. And hopefully this would be a deterrent, a sufficient deterrent for this attack to never happen. Um, also making the crypto faster. And this construction is not quantum resistant. Um, however, Dan Bonnet has been working on a variation that uses uh, lattice cryptography, and that one is it, it, it's promising. I think I think there is no obstacle on it. So, if we do WISC, we could just swap the, the crypto for quantum resistant in like five to ten years. So we are covered on that front. So that's all. Thank you so much for your attention. And uh, yeah, I'm also the team lead at Lostar. You can stay with it and participate in climate diversity in Mainnet. Thank you. Uh, yeah, good presentation. Thank you. One question I had is you, you mentioned uh, adopting like this method, like a single uh, uh, the SSLE, uh, would double the size of the state. Hmm. Uh, is that just due to the fact that you have to store, I'm looking for the word, uh, all of a sudden, the um, uh, trackers? Yeah. Uh, is that because of that? Or, uh, is yes, that in, the, in the current design, you have to store a tracker. And a tracker is a G, so RG and KRG. Basically, th this, this thing, the output of the commit function. And you also have to store um, something called the identity binding to prevent you being able to sell your position into someone else. Okay. So that's basically three G1 points per validator record. But so the state is doubling in size, yes, but what is the base state in the, in the, in the CL? Uh, it's not that big, is it? So th the thing is, in the beacon chain, anything that is per validator just gets blown out of proportion just because we have so many indexes. Right. So basically, everything except the validator array is noise to the state size. Okay. Uh, and I had a second question, but I can't quite remember. Oh, yeah, no, it wasn't. It was just a remark. Uh, blowing up the size by s of the block by 17 kilobytes. Uh, Vercall will double the size of the block. Like we'll add 150 kilobytes, so 17. Uh, it's pretty much free. Uh, cool. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, you mentioned that. You're looking into quantum resistant stuff with lattices. Um, wouldn't, wouldn't commitment of lattices blow up the state size? So I, I have no idea of what's the actual um, data complexity of that protocol. Um, I, don't, I don't have enough knowledge about it. I just know that um, Dan and his team, they are looking into it and they have a construction that theoretically works, but we have not looked at the practicalities. Like this is way too far away. Hey, great talk. Uh, I have two kind of separate questions. One is you talked about um, LSTs needing to take this into account, but do you think that there's a way to force them to, uh, I guess, be incentive compatible with this instead of just sharing their, like forcing their validators to share the K with each other and then opening up that, that um, 
tax surface again? Right, excellent question. Yeah, I, th I think that would be the only way. Like, if LSTs want to have strict accountability of who's missing blocks, between the LST, they would need some way to, to, to track them. So, I hope someone can come up with a clever construction where you can submit proof that you were not the one that had to propose. So, the absence of the proof would show that you are the one that lost the block. Um, yeah, thanks. And then the other question is, I know you can also get SSLE from MPC, do you think that we could also, since we're, we already take in some trust assumptions from the, the beacon chain, like, do you think that you could overload um, the beacon chain with, with, like, MPC protocols to be able to do the SSLE, or, or is that not possible? Well, by, by some definition, this protocol is already MPC, because you are performing um, the shuffle with the participation of multiple people that introduce bits of randomness to, to a bigger shuffle. So I'm not sure if that answers the question, but... I think we have time for one more question, if there's any. Okay, cool. Then thanks so much. Thank you so much. <laughs>